Welcome to The Loop Podcast, where we are transforming education in plastic surgery since 2020. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Loop Podcast. Today's episode is a resident-based in-service review of breast reconstruction. This is not meant to be a comprehensive review. However, it is a breakdown of key points from previous examinations that may help if you are studying for boards or the in-service. This is a pretty hefty topic, as you can imagine, for breast reconstruction, and it is also a major topic on the in-service. I have here with me Dr. Brian Basiri Tarani. Brian is a core host and is an integral part of the Loop Committee. You will be hearing from him frequently on this channel. That being said, Brian, let's hear about your background and why you joined the Loop. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Basiri Tarani. I'm currently a PGY7 at the University of Illinois at Chicago. I'm originally from Long Island, New York. I graduated undergrad from the City College of New York and graduated medical school from Stony Brook on Long Island. I did my intern year at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and finished my general surgery training at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City. Not 100% sure what I plan to do after graduating, but uh, I've always been interested in teaching students and residents every stage of my training. And so I'm super excited to be part of the loop. We all hope this will be a helpful resource for residents preparing for the yearly plastic surgery in service. And thanks, Morgan, for having me. Okay, thanks for joining. Now let's get started with anatomy. What are the borders of the breast? The borders of the breast are the sternum medially, clavicle superiorly, inframammary fold inferiorly, and the anterior border of the latissimus dorsi muscle laterally. What is the innervation to the breast? So the innervation of the breast It is the third, fourth, and fifth intercostal nerves, and they are responsible for the majority of the innervation of the breast. So a key point is the anterior branch of the fourth intercostal nerve provides sensation to the nipple areolar complex in a nipple sparing mastectomy. That is important to remember. It has been a question previously, and it is thought to be also the most erogenous branch. Again, that is the fourth intercostal nerve. So what are some other important anatomy points to mention? So the pedicle tram uses the superior epigastric artery system. And in these cases, you can delay the flap by cutting the deep inferior epigastric artery. Also, if the patient has a history of a subcostal or coker incision for an open close vasectomy, that would violate that. And therefore, they cannot get a right-sided tram because of that procedure. If a patient had a C-section or a fan and steel incision, this is not a contraindication to a deep flap. In fact, this may actually be beneficial because if they cut the superficial system, it's essentially performing a delay procedure in that it will augment flow through the deep epigastric artery system. Morgan, what is the heart tramp model of perfusion zones? So this is referring to the lower abdomen during a deep flap. If you can imagine the tissue below the umbilicus divided into four zones, medial, then lateral. Right medial is one, left medial is two, right lateral is three, and left lateral is four. So using the right inferior epigastric pedicle, if the flap is based on medial perforators, then the perfusion is one, two, three, then four. If based on the lateral perforators, then perfusion is one, three, two, then four. This may be easiest to understand if you can access this episode on our YouTube channel. We will provide a diagram to make this a little bit easier. Again, that was the heart tramp model of perfusion zones, the lower abdominal wall based on the inferior epigastric pedicle. Great. What are some breast cancer considerations? The average risk for breast cancer in women is one in eight. Guidelines from the American Cancer Society currently state women at average risk for breast cancer should begin having yearly mammograms by age 45 and can change to having mammograms every other year beginning at age 55. Women should have the choice to start screening with a yearly mammogram as early as 40 if they so choose. Okay, Brian, where does breast carcinoma originate from? Breast carcinoma originates from glandular tissues such as ducts. Rarely you can see adenocarcinoma from lymphatics, sarcoma from muscle, or Paget's disease from the areola. Okay, tell me about breast conservation therapy. Breast conservation therapy basically refers to performing a lumpectomy, also known as a partial mastectomy. Breast conservation rates are improved with neoadjuvant systemic therapy. Basically, that happens because you're shrinking the tumor. Patients are more likely to be candidates for lumpectomy after neoadjuvant therapy. Absolute contraindications to breast conservation include 
multicentric disease with two or more tumors in separate quadrants of the breast, such that they cannot be encompassed in a single excision. If they have diffuse malignant microcalcifications on mammography or a history of prior radiation in the same breast or chest wall, that's because you cannot receive additional rounds of radiation if you have already received radiation in the past. Pregnancy is a relative contraindication. You cannot undergo breast conservation therapy if in your first trimester because you will need adjuvant radiation therapy and that's contraindicated during pregnancy. However, the caveat to that is if you're in your late second trimester or in your third trimester because you could defer radiation after delivery. And another absolute contraindication to breast conservation therapy is persistently positive margins despite re-excision. Relative contraindications, important too, that includes small size of breast and poor cosmetic results and then depending on where you are in pregnancy, like I mentioned earlier. Okay. A word about LCIS, which is lobular carcinoma in situ. So there's not a ton that you need to know about this for the in-service exam, but do know that patients with LCIS on biopsy have an increased risk of future carcinoma. So the NCCN treatment guidelines state that patients with LCIS on biopsy, they do need an excisional biopsy, but clear margins are not necessary. And due to increased risk of carcinoma, They need close follow-up with every six months, they need a clinical follow-up, which basically just means come to your office, they need a physical exam, but then they do need a yearly mammogram. You can consider doing a yearly breast MRI or also a yearly full breast ultrasound or contrast enhanced mammogram. Next is phylloides tumor. This requires wide local excision, which prevents local recurrence. Next, atypical hyperplasia. These patients have a 4.5 to 5-fold increased risk for developing breast cancer. It's increased by use of oral contraceptives. Brian, what are the risk factors for hormone-sensitive invasive ductal carcinoma? So that includes postmenopausal obesity, early menarche, late menopause, hormone replacement therapy, and who has decreased risk? Early stage at first pregnancy also breastfeeding. So I think about it like this, any patient that has a decreased number of periods. So an early first pregnancy and breastfeeding, they both decrease your total lifetime number of periods and total lifetime exposure to estrogen. The same is true for the opposite. So all things that give you more periods, such as early menarche, that increases your exposure to estrogen and therefore increases your risk for hormone sensitive breast cancer. Okay, now let's talk about radiation. Who gets radiation? Indications for post-mastectomy radiation therapy include patients with large tumors, five centimeters or bigger, four or more involved lymph nodes, positive or close margins, and those with locally advanced breast cancer. So that includes anything that involves the chest wall. In the acute period, the effect of radiation may manifest themselves as erythema, edema of the skin, desquamation, hyperpigmentation, ulceration, and this can range from mild to severe. So chronically, radiation changes include skin atrophy, dryness, telangiectasia, dyspigmentation, and dyschromia. These effects are due to endothelial injury and lymphatic obliteration. This eventually leads to capillary thrombosis and subsequent inadequate tissue oxygenation. Over time, non-healing ulcers can spontaneously develop even sometimes years later. Also, patients can get osteoradionecrosis of the underlying rib. Also with radiation, there is increased capsular contracture rates with implant-based reconstruction. Morgan, which mastectomy patients get chest wall radiation? So yes, so patients who have greater than three axillary lymph nodes that are positive. What drugs are used for treating breast cancer? Hormonal agents include aromatase inhibitors such as inositol. This impairs conversion of androgens to estrogens. Estrogens promote natural breast tissue growth, so therefore blocking estrogen can treat hormone-sensitive breast cancer. Chemotherapeutic agents include taxanes, anthracyclines, alkylating agents, and platinum agents. What are the mastectomy considerations? So starting with nipple sparing mastectomy, this has an increased risk of nipple necrosis when the incision is periareolar. And this is not associated with specimen weight or implant size, is purely based on the location of the incision. 
So what are the contraindications for nipple sparing mastectomy? There's several, and it's important, uh, especially in patients with breast cancer. So the first one would be inflammatory breast cancer. Next is tumors that are close to the nipple, and that's measured about two centimeters or less. Tumor involving the retroareolar biopsy. Large totic breasts are considered a contraindication because it can affect the nipple malposition. Tumors that are greater than five centimeters. Axillary disease. HER2 or new positive uh, tumors, lymphovascular invasion, and there are several other relative contraindications, one of which is being a smoker. What should we know about contralateral prophylactic mastectomy? Okay, so a contralateral prophylactic mastectomy provides no oncologic benefit for the average risk woman. However, it does increase the risk of overall complications, and you can think of this as in they're having double the surgery. Patients with breast cancer need a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Who gets a completion axillary dissection? So in 2014, the American Society of Clinical Oncology Guidelines recommended axillary lymph node dissection for patients who have had three or more metastatic sentinel lymph nodes on sentinel lymph node biopsy or who have one or two metastatic lymph nodes on sentinel lymph node biopsy but do not want whole breast radiation. Now moving on to autologous tissue reconstruction. Free flop selection is based on surgical history and presence of sufficient tissue at the proposed donor site. A variety of flap donor options exist, including the abdomen, buttocks, flank, and thighs. Preoperative imaging, such as CTA, may elucidate vessel anatomy, but is not always critical. So the latissimus flap is a popular muscle flap for breast reconstruction, and it's based off the thoracodorsal artery. The muscle is harvested with a skin paddle, although this typically does not provide sufficient volume for breast reconstruction. Because of this, in order to achieve a desired breast volume, the latissimus flap is often used in combination with a prosthesis, whether it's a tissue expander or an implant, depending on the skin available and the, the ability to cover it. This can also be used as a salvage procedure in cases such as mastectomy, skin flap necrosis, or um, from ulceration from radiation. Next is the tram flap, and this I'm currently referring to as a pedicle tram. So this is based off the superior epigastric vessels from the internal mammary artery. So you must make sure that these vessels are intact. And this means you cannot use this flap after open cholecystectomy on the right side, as we previously mentioned, or on the left side after a cabbage, which uses the left internal mammary artery. So there is donor site morbidity with taking the the rectus muscle, and patients who have a high BMI are at increased risk of tissue-related ischemia. They will likely need large flaps, so therefore you should consider delaying these flaps by cutting the deep inferior epigastric vessels about two weeks prior. So in general, free tissue from abdomen such as deep has improved reliability and decreased fat necrosis compared with the pedicled flap reconstruction. Now let's move on to abdominal based free flap reconstruction for breast reconstruction. The options include free tram, muscle sparing tram, deep inferior epigastric perforator flap, and a superficial inferior epigastric artery flap. So the SIEA or the superficial inferior epigastric artery flap, this has a greater risk of flap failure and it has a higher arterial thrombosis rate compared to the deep flap. Comorbidities that have been mentioned include obesity and their increase in complications is noted with a BMI of 35 or higher. Biggest problem is wound breakdown and delayed wound healing in these patients. Another comorbidity that increases complications is lupus, and these patients have a higher rate of thrombosis within the free flap reconstruction. So how do we get flap sensation? Intercostal nerve, usually T10, can be co-opted to the anterior branch of the fourth intercostal nerve. In regards to postoperative monitoring, clinical exam remains the gold standard for postoperative flap monitoring. However, arterial Doppler or internal venous Dopplers can be used. So when do we take back a flap? First, if there's an arterial problem, such as a lack of inflow, you will see a pale color to the flap or the skin paddle. When there is a venous problem or venous congestion, the flap will appear red or purple in color. So when you have venous congestion, sometimes it can be helpful to use the SIEV to help augment the venous outflow. And sometimes flaps can actually be reliant on the SIEV. So it's important to check to see if it looks engorged after you have hooked up the artery, um, after you have done your arterial anastomosis. 
Some other things to consider, heparin really has no benefit unless there is thrombosis seen. Venous couplers do not increase thrombosis or patency issues. And one versus two veins is surgeon preference and continues to be debated. However, again, going back to what you said, if you do see that there is congestion at the SIEV after you do your anastomosis of the artery, something you, you should consider for turbocharging. So next, a word about patient satisfaction. We have seen an improved patient satisfaction with autologous breast reconstruction in the setting of a unilateral reconstruction. So there should be consideration for autologous reconstruction in the setting of either a unilateral reconstruction, a patient with a totic breast, a patient with large breast, or a history of radiation. Let's move on to implant-based reconstruction. What are the advantages of implant-based reconstruction? So advantages include a decreased operative time, no donor site morbidity, and a faster patient recovery. What are the disadvantages? Disadvantages include implant-related complications like infection, capsular contraction, capsular contracture, and implant malposition, needing to return to the OR. Why would we use ADM in implant-based reconstruction? So ADM, or acellular dermal matrix, is a useful adjunct that provides total implant coverage while defining and maintaining implant position. It also decreases capsular contracture. What about radiation with implants? Adjuvant radiation therapy significantly increases the rate of complication and reconstructive failure following implant-based reconstruction while decreasing patient-reported aesthetic outcomes and quality of life measures. Let's talk about complications. What are the risk factors for complications with implant-based reconstruction? The risk factors for complications at implant-based reconstruction include smoking, obesity with a BMI greater than 35, and also diabetes with a hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5%. What do we need to know about infection with implant-based reconstruction? The most common organism with implant or expander-based reconstruction, so the number one is a gram-positive organism and it is Staph aureus. The number two is Staph epidermidis. If the patient has a gram-negative organism, number one is Pseudomonas, which is number three overall. And this is treated with advanced beta-lactam, such as paparicillin, ceftazidime, carbapenems, quinolones, and aminoglycosides. So again, this is very important. So if you have an infection of implant or an expander, the number one organism is Staph aureus, number two is Staph epidermidis, and number three is Pseudomonas. These are higher rates of infection in smoking, chemo, history of radiation, mastectomy skin necrosis, obesity with a BMI of greater than 30, poorly controlled diabetes with a hemoglobin A1C of greater than 6.5, and perioperative blood glucose of over 200, and post-op seroma. Regarding infection or exposure salvage, we have a lower implant salvage in culture-positive staph aureus or staph epidermidis. Number two, if there is purulent fluid around the implant, if the patient has a fever, if the patient has an increased white blood cell count, or if there is early contamination or biofilm present, all of these things make a lower salvage rate of the implant. So this is very important. Another way to say it is that the patient is more likely to lose their implant reconstruction if they have these findings, including culture-positive staph aureus, purulent fluid, fever, increased white cell count, or early contamination. In terms of preventing infection, there is evidence that suggests that preoperative antibiotics within 30 minutes of incision is effective and that continuing antibiotics for 24 hours post-op. However, there is no evidence for continuing antibiotics while the drain is in place. Let's quickly mention a word about acute complications. So acute complications such as hematoma, infection, and mastectomy skin flap necrosis must be treated quickly and aggressively to avoid implant loss and suboptimal aesthetic outcome. Now, delayed seroma, which is greater than one year post-op, there's an important algorithm to follow. That algorithm includes first to use an ultrasound to identify if there's periprosthetic fluid. Then if there is fluid present, you need an FNA to rule out breast implant-associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma, aka ALCL. This has likely a multifactorial etiology, possibly genetic, as in the patient may have a genetic predisposition. There may be an effect of a chronic biofilm, and there has been some suggestion of Ralstonia species, which is a gram-negative bacteria. Biofilms are also implicated in capsular contracture, but in that scenario, the most likely organism is staph. 
Next, implant rupture. So MRI is the most sensitive test to detect an implant rupture. And the recommendation is to screen at three years and then every two years to look for silent rupture of implants. Let's talk a little bit more about tissue expanders. Benefits of expanders when patients is undergoing radiation therapy. This is important for patients because it saves the patient back or abdominal tissue for reconstruction after radiation. It preserves the skin envelope. They are associated with a higher complication rate with radiation compared to autologous tissue. There is a higher explantation rate of tissue expanders with radiation when compared with implants and radiation. So put in another way, if your patient has many comorbidities, including smoking, and you know the patient's going to have radiation, you can put in a tissue expander and save the skin envelope in hopes to restore a more natural and aesthetic outcome in the long term. Morgan, what about the use of ADM? When you use ADM, there's a decreased capsular contracture rate. However, there may be an increased seroma rate, and there may be an increased infection rate. What should you do with hyperdynamic deformity of the breast with subpectoral implant placement? So in this scenario, when the patient has a hyperdynamic deformity, you should move to the prepectoral plane and use ADM. Now let's talk about nipple reconstruction. Single pedicle nipple reconstruction. So let's talk about the blood supply to that. That's the subdermal plexus. The most likely long-term complication of nipple reconstruction is loss of projection. Advantages of nipple reconstruction is that it improves overall satisfaction with reconstruction. So other types of breast reconstruction, so fat grafting, this is associated with significant risk of benign findings such as cysts and calcifications, but it is not associated with recurrent cancer or ALCL or infection. Benign breast disease is also included in this section of the in-service. So let's talk about that really quick. Sure. Let's start with fibroadenoma. This is the most common breast tumor in adolescents and females age 14 to 16. Juvenile fibroadenoma is a variant, and that's normal stromal epithelial balance uh, disruption. This distinguishes it from phylloides tumor. Giant fibroadenoma is one that is five centimeters or bigger, and that's a clinical diagnosis. And there's also complex fibroadenoma in which fibrocystic changes are seen on glandular tissue. So next, phyllodes tumor. So this is large, rapidly growing lesion and can be either benign or malignant, and the treatment is wide local excision. Next is superficial thrombophlebitis, which is also known as Mondor disease. This is when patient comes in with pain, redness, and swelling in the presence of a thick and tender cord. This is typically managed with NSAIDs. So what are some general surgical considerations? So decreasing perioperative infections is very important. This can be done by nasal mepirecin and chlorhexidine baths for five days prior to surgery. Uh, chloroprep skin preparations for surgery decreases surgical uh, site infection rates more effectively than betadine alone. Perioperative antibiotics should be administered with enough advanced time to achieve proper and adequate rates of skin penetration. With ANSEF, this is typically 30 to 59 minutes before skin incision. Blood glucose control is critical to decreasing surgical site infection rates with optimal rates usually being quoted as less than 180 milligrams per deciliter. Smoking cessation decreases surgical site infection rates if the patient does not smoke for four weeks prior to surgery and also after surgery. Continuing antibiotics for 24 hours with implants is also very important. Now, lastly, a word on ethics. The Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act signed into law in 1998 requires insurance plans to cover the cost of breast reconstruction after mastectomy. The law includes all stages of reconstruction, including revisions, as well as contralateral procedures to provide symmetry. So what factors impact women to not undergo reconstruction? Living far away from a reconstructive surgeon and no insurance or Medicaid. Those two are the most important factors in decreasing rates of reconstruction. All right, everyone, that was a ton of information, and I hope it was helpful. That was an overview of what you are most likely to see on the in-surface exam related to breast reconstruction. Thanks, Brian, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Loop. If you would like to become a part of this production, reach out to us via social media or email us at theloopodcast at gmail.com. 
follow us for more educational content, including the recorded episodes with visual supplements. You can find these on Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, or our website. Just search at The Loop Podcast. Myself, Dr. Morgan Martin, along with Greta Davis, are the co-founders for this podcast and are responsible for its production and design. Editing along with graphic art production is by Greta Davis. Music was produced by myself, Dr. Morgan Martin. Our core hosts include Dr. Zanan Zahidi, resident at UC Davis in Sacramento, California. Dr. Brian Basiri tarani independent resident at University of Illinois at Chicago. Dr. Casey Sheck, independent resident at Cooper University Hospital in Camden, New Jersey. And myself, Dr. Morgan Martin, independent resident at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Content has been referenced from various textbooks and articles, including Grab and Smith's Plastic Surgery by Kevin Chung, as well as Essentials of Plastic Surgery edited by Jeffrey Janis. Contributors to content include Dr. Alexander Hart. Guest hosts will be introduced and credited during their respective episodes. The Loop Medical Student Committee is responsible for editing content. Members include committee heads Sarah Cabetti and Zane Aranapour. Thank you for listening. The best way to show your appreciation is to give us a rating to keep us at the top of the charts. This will allow more listeners to have access to this content and motivate us to continue bringing you high-yield content to supplement your education at plastic surgery. Congratulations, you are now in The Loop.